<laughs> Hi and welcome to A Red Reviews, the podcast where we talk about uh, random books that have to do with leftist theory uh, with my friend Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Corey. How's it going? Yeah, it's going pretty well. Yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a beautiful day here in sunny Indianapolis. I've been just kind of, uh, it's one of my remote work days, so I've just been working from home, which is nice. Oh, nice. And, uh, and excited about talking about our book tonight, which will be a lot of fun, I think. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, um, I guess you could say the pollen is everywhere. Like you can, it, <laughs> yes. there's so much coming off of the trees. It actually looks like it's snowing. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. So. So it's been quite quite the day, but and for us without with for those of us with allergies, it's much more of a stay inside day. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, I definitely felt a little bit a bit bit of that on Saturday when I mowed my lawn. Um, there was a little bit of that for sure, where I was just like, "Oh my god, I need to get inside." This is too much. <laughs> um, yeah. Even on all the drugs, I still need to go exactly, inside. <laughs> exactly. So it's yeah. just like this is this is just too much. Yeah, it's too much. Um, and. And we just, sometimes we just need to relax, don't we? Right. That's right. And that's my segue. Nice. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about um, Bertrand Russell's excellent book, um, In Praise of Idleness, nice. um, which is a classic book of his from 1935, whose ideas are in many respects just as radical today as they were when he wrote it, which is either a good thing or a sad thing. I can't really figure out which. Right. Um, yeah. And he was, uh, to give people some background. So Bertrand Russell was probably the most influential British philosopher of the 20th century. Um, he was in many respects, one of the fathers of the analytical movement in philosophy. Um, analytical philosophy is focused in on the structure of logic, mathematics, and the um, intricacies of language, um, how we use language, how, how do we put together a logical argument? Th th he was really one of the fathers of that. Um, uh, a, a lot of atheists in the atheist community were big fans of Bertrand Russell. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big, big time. Um, he um, and he I mean, he's probably best known today for his book, Why I Am Not a Christian, which is right. another excellent book that I'm rereading right now. And and. Um, and so, yes, he was very much a atheist. A lot of people know him for the idea of Russell's teapot. Um, so Russell's teapot's a thought experiment that he kind of came up with. So he sort of described the problems with faith because he sort of said, well, if you can believe in a God, then I can believe in a celestial teapot that goes around the sun. Yeah. I can't see it. I can't hear it. Don't know what's there, but I have faith that it is. Yeah. Um, and sort of a, it's sort of a reductio ad absurdum to get people to realize that basing things solely on faith is not great. Um, and I mean, he lived to be almost like a hundred, uh, wow. like, and, um, and so he was born in the 1870s and he died in the 1970s or close to it. That's um, wild. and so he sort of saw so much, uh, during his long, <clears throat> long life. And as somebody who kind of came from privilege, you know, his grandfather was Lord John Russell, who had been prime minister twice during the reign <laughs> of Queen Victoria. Jeez. Um, he was, you know, he went to private, he went to private schools. He went to, he, um, was privately tutored for a good chunk of his life, was a mathematical prodigy. Um, you would have thought that his politics would be rather conservative and right. they, they were not, um, his politics were actually pretty damn radical. Um, he sort of came out of the, you know, essentially a form of British non-Marxist socialism. So Brussel is not a Marxist. In fact, he's actually quite critical of Marxism mm -hmm. um, and, and Leninism too. I mean, he wrote a book called, I think it's called The Theory and Practice of Bol Bolshevism, where he critiques Lenin. He met okay. Lenin. Um, you know, he was sort of kind of enthusiastic about the Russian Revolution, but then he went over there and like met Lenin and like saw the Soviet Union firsthand in like 1919, 1920. Didn't really like what he saw and wrote about it. Um, and he was very much a pacifist. He was, he was, um, he lived long enough to be against world war one in the 1910s when he was okay. in his forties and to be against the Vietnam war in the 1960s when he was in his nineties. Wow. Um, and was arrested 
for his anti-war beliefs. Um, he was also very he was also very radical on notions of sex and gender and marriage and morality. Um, you know, he was, he was much more open to the idea of what today we would probably call like polyamory. Right. Um, back then they would have called it free love. Okay. Um, uh, but, um, but he was kind of into that, um, and was also in very many, in many respects, kind of a proto-feminist where he was very critical of the ways in which this systems and, and he understood it very clearly as a socialist that, um, that the systems of production and distribution have set it up so that these gender norms are set up that way. They're not sort of right. innate or born in. Um, this book, uh, in praise of idleness is a collection of essays, um, that he wrote over probably a span of 10 years. Um, he was published. He was one of those guys who did a tremendous amount of very technical, very philosophically astute work. He's best known, f- uh, his probably his most, important contribution to philosophy was called the Principia Mathematica, which is something he co-authored with Alfred North Whitehead, where they wrote it over a period of 10 (laughs) years and essentially revolutionized the field of mathematics and mathematical logic. Um, And, uh, and some of that stuff I can't even begin to understand, Um, (laughs) (laughs) but, but, um, but he was also, somebody who wrote popular stuff. So he was somebody who was very much a dedicated philosopher who wrote serious academic philosophical work, but also wrote a lot of stuff for the public. And, you know, you would think, well, his writing is probably a little hard to read. It actually isn't um, because he prides himself on being logical. So when you read him, he's almost Vulcan-like in his, in his logic. Right. And he's very clear and he's also funny. He, he's also can be kind of humorous and funny and, um, and kind of, Oh, that's clever. That's witty. Um, but what he's arguing in this book is something that a lot of people around the time that he was writing were starting to think about, okay. which is that, you know, by the 1930s, you get to the emergence of the eight hour day, eventually get into the emergence of the idea of the weekend, the 40 hour work week. All of this comes as a result of labor unions and, and active struggle by people of all right. political stripes on the left who fought for those kinds of reforms. And Russell is one of those people who's sort of looking forward to what he thinks the 20th century, most of the 20th century is going to be like. And he was not alone in his, in sort of his prognostications on this. So like, um, you know, John Maynard Keynes, the great British economist we've talked about before on the podcast, he was somebody who sort of thought about this too, where, you know, he talked about how like the greatest, (laughs) the greatest problem of the 20th century would be boredom. Right, um, right. Because he believed and Russell believed that eventually economic development and industrial organization would get to a point where the vast majority of people wouldn't have to work all that much. <laughs> and they were wrong about that um, <laughs> yeah. through a variety yeah. of ways, in a variety of ways. But I think that their ideas nevertheless are very, I think, important. And I think we, you know, the, the basic structure of work in the developed world really hasn't changed all that much in about a hundred years. Right. You know, most people work if they're lucky work the 40 hour work week where they have the two days off on the weekends and they're in, they're working eight to five or some, or eight, nine to five and they're working. And obviously most people work much longer than that. Um, and we sort of say, well, that's just the best it can be. Well, what Russell, I think, does is what I think all great thinkers should do, which is to widen the horizon of possibility. And so um, he he proposes in the title essay in praise of idleness that um, he basically thinks that work in and of itself is not a virtue. And this idea that it's a virtue is bullshit. Right. Um, he, he says that it kind of creates in people um, the morality of a slave, that he basically that like if you think of the only thing is worthwhile for humans to do is work, then you see them as nothing more than mere slaves. Right, and if anything, we're just sort of reifying the master-slave relationship, um, and so he proposes that um, we need to radically rethink what it means to have um, a life full of leisure. And so, what does he mean by leisure? Because a lot of people are like, "Well, his book's called In Praise of Idleness." What does that really mean? Mm-hmm. What it means is that that you devote yourself towards better pursuits that you use your leisure time to do things that are constructive, not only for yourself and for others, but for the broader society as a whole. 
So, you know, not to toot our own horn, but this is kind of a version of what he was talking about. Okay. Using leisure time to educate yourself and to share ideas and do things with others. He also talked about the value of, of spending time with family and, fa- and how families were important. Um, but he also has some radical ideas about the family, which are cool, which we'll get into in a minute. Cool. Um, but, um, but he basically starts, he, he argues that we work too damn much. We shouldn't work this much and we should organize society differently. And so I can agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so his central idea in the essay, his core proposal is one that was radical then and it's still radical now, which is the four hour workday. Nice. He argues for a four hour workday. And so he says, well, how are we going to get there? And what he argues is that you can actually have a society of full employment that way. So if you paid if you paid people the same for four hours as you would for eight or ten hours, right. then they could have they could have their lives and and provide for their families and provide to the economic livelihood of a society, and then everybody else could could then come in and do their four hour shift, right? And then we could sort of make that work. Um, he predicates this on basically the emergence of industrial planning and technology. So this is where I think I'm a little critical of him in the sense that I, I, I don't think that he thinks it's inevitable, but he doesn't kind of give you, he's making a basic philosophical point of like, this is what we should do and here's why we should do it, mm-hmm. but not really how you get there. He was, you know, it's not much of a, okay, so you have to have a revolution and the workers have to gain control right, of the state right. in order to do this. This is not a praxis kind of thing. This is this not is- a praxis kind of thing. This is much more a theoretical thing. And I think he sort of assumes that he's like, well, industrial production has allowed people to work less. And in the future, more industrial production and organization and planning of the economy will allow for people to work less and less and less. He just sort of assumes, well, that's the way it's going to go. Um and it didn't, but like you could, you could see where the logic of where he was at the time where it's like, okay, in his lifetime, he's seen people go from a 16 hour day to a 12 hour day to a 10 hour day to an eight hour day. Like it right. makes logical sense. Cause he's seen that in his own lifetime. It's going to keep going down. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's writing this book. He's writing a lot of this when he's in his fifties and sixties. So he's seen a lot in his life where it's kind of, it has led to that. So it seems right. logical that it will lead it to there. Um, and he also says that the way and the way to build a society where idle time um, isn't like sort of wasted is by investing in public education. So he firmly believes that the way that people can successfully use their leisure time is by becoming well educated and in using their talents towards other things. And so, you know, he has this great quote in the essay, um, which is very much harkens back to. Um, a, let me see if I can find it. Um, it actually kind of harkens back to the quote, um, that we've talked about with Marx where it's like, you know, like I can fish in the morning, I can hunt in the evening and I can critic, but I'm not necessarily a hunter or, or, or a critic Right. in a world where no one is compelled to work more than four hours a day. Every p- person possessed of scientific curiosity will be able to indulge it. And every painter will be able to paint without starving. However, excellent his pictures may be. Uh, young writers will not be obliged to draw attention to themselves by sensational pot boilers with a view to acquiring the economic independence needed for monumental works for which when the time at last comes, they will have lost the taste and the capacity men who in their professional work have become interested in some phase of economics or government will be able to develop their ideas without the academic detachment that makes the work of university economists seem lacking in reality. Medical men will have time to learn about the progress of medicine. Teachers will not be exasperatedly struggling to teach by routine methods, things which they learned in their youth, which may in the interval have been proved to be untrue. Above all, there will be happiness and joy of life instead of frayed nerves, weariness, and dyspepsia. Um, That's kind of basically like an old-fashioned term for like anxiety. Okay. Um, The work exacted will be enough to make leisure delightful, but not enough to produce exhaustion. So that kind of echoes what Marx is saying in the economic and philosophical manuscripts about like, you know, I can hunt in the morning, I can fish in the fish in the afternoon, I can right. critique in the evening, but I'm neither a fi- fisherman or, nor a hunter nor a critic. He's sort of making the same argument that, that people can devote themselves to the better, the better part of being human. 
um, because he sort of he makes this really he talks about how leisure in and of itself is not necessarily a good thing. Very much like work in and of itself is not a good thing. Work is a means to get us to the ends we want to get at. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with leisure. So he has this great point where he makes these like, yes, the leisure class from time to time. And he's talking about like, you know, rich people right. who don't work. So he's like, you know, occasionally the leisure class will produce someone like Charles Darwin. Um, but for every Charles Darwin, <laughs> you're going to get a bunch of people who are shiftless, you know, Far more likely you're Low getting fastest. a Donald Trump Jr. or Donald yeah, Trump. Yeah, more than likely you're going to get – yeah, more than likely you're going to get somebody who kind of sucks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he says like yeah, – this is the exact quote because it's actually kind of great. The class might produce one Darwin, but against him had to be set tens of thousands of country gentlemen who never thought of anything more intelligent than fox hunting and punishing poachers. Right. So it's like, yeah, he's like, he's like yeah, the leisure class sucks too. They're kind of the part of the problem too, that like um, that the leisure class as it's set up in their current capitalist system lends itself towards these sort of idle loafers who don't do anything but like, you yeah. know, fucking fox hunt and shit and like, I don't know, yell epithets at, you know, racial minorities. Like that's like, you know, and so he's saying like if we build a society where people get to work less – but devote themselves towards, you know, education and betterment and their hobbies and their passions and their talents, then we're going to create a better world because it's going to, it's going to create the space for more creativity and ultimately more innovation because people will be using their creative juices instead of working every fucking day. Right. They're going to be using their creative capacities to do other things. Um, You know, uh, because he sort of makes the argument that it's like leisure has made civilization possible and he's right. You know, you know, and, and so, um, so yeah, I think that, you know, and I wrote about this recently and it's up on the blog where I talk about this book. Um, but you know, yeah, maybe the four hour work day isn't coming anytime soon, but the four day work week is, and I think yep. that's something that like we can uh, in the immediate term definitely argue for. Yeah. Um, there was a, a Washington Post did an, uh, wrote an article about a study that was done in Britain of, of many different businesses across different types of, 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 um, of uh, commerce. So like, you know, firms where you had like a nine to five office job, but then also like fish and chip shops and stuff like that. Okay. And they talked about how not only did the, the four hour work week work in the sense that like they didn't lose any revenue. And in some respects they gained revenue because they were more productive. Um, but the employees were much happier. People had more time with their children and, um, and the morale of everybody was much better and people didn't quit. The turnover was not as bad because people didn't get burnt out. Yeah, um, yeah. The churn, right? As they call it, um, I think they call it an Amazon. They call it the churn, where okay. most people who work at an Amazon fulfillment center or a warehouse burns out usually within three years. At my um, job, we just say, well, this job isn't for everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> and, and so, you know. We're predicating, okay, so how would a work four hour, what, if we were ever get a four hour work day, how would we do that? Well, we get to that through socialism. It's, 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 and that's what the argument that he makes throughout the book and in mm. theories of idleness. And then there's two other essays specifically on socialism that we'll discuss. Um, one of them we talked about in the pregame where we were talking about how sometimes he will have essays that have really interesting, radical ideas that are cool. But their name, but the essay names are like really boring. So there's a great essay in this book called Architecture and Social Questions, which is a very boring title. Um, and um, yeah, it doesn't sound like there's a lot going on there. <laughs> not much going on there, right? And the essay kind of starts boring enough. One thing that I really do like about Russell, whenever he's trying, when he writes an essay about a topic, he starts the essays with history. So he kind of explains, well, how did we get to the idea of, of art? So he talks about like the history of architecture and how it developed over time. And specifically he talks about the idea of architecture of social spaces. Okay. So he talks about like the development of monasteries and the development of like churches as social places. And then eventually that develops into the universities and then and into public housing. But the real central idea in his book that's kind of cool is, and in many respects is kind of, it's very like pro family while also being rather feminist at the same time, which is the idea of like public communal housing with free universal childcare in it. So he's talking about this. So he argues for building public housing that is free, high quality childcare for every one of its tenants. 
so that women can go work and they and then they can come back and spend the best time of their day with their children. Quality time with their kids. Yeah. Quality time with their kids. Because he does make the argument that he's like, you know, sometimes it's not good for parents to be around their kids all the time. I yeah. know and I know that sounds like rather <laughs> counterintuitive, but he's right, right? Like, like Every what, parent knows this. You know, I, I, I'm not a parent, so I, I, I can't really speak for it, but That's I know. That's why we hide in the bathroom. That's why we go outside. Bingo, right? <laughs> and so he, he um, you know, he, he makes the argument that, uh, you know, that he talks about how um, part of the reason why it's so terrible for women working outside of the home and the problems that we have with children is because we have all these terrible uh, systems where kids don't get taken care of and the women are sort of stuck taking care of kids at home and they can't be, they can't go out and work. And so he says, really the solution to that is public housing with free universal childcare. And I think that's cool. And I think that's exactly right. The other thing he talks, I mean, he also talks about things that may not always gel well, like communal meals and shit, which we can get into whether or not you actually want to do that. But like, but like well, he, but he does. There's lots of philosophy behind that. There's actually. lots of <laughs> philosophy behind the, like communal meals and things like that. But he, he thinks it's just, it'll be better for kids because then they can get, they can get early education. They can get uh, good right. meals, you know, because he talks about how he's like, you know, some women they're not always the best cooks. So like maybe we could hire people who are really good at making food for kids um, yep. and, in, and yep. who enjoy spending time with children and are good at it. Right. Yep. Um, because he talks about sometimes like some parents don't really aren't very good with their kids. And sometimes it's yep. better to have them, you know, in, in environments where they're not around their parents all the time. Yep. Um, I right. know that again, that sounds rather blasphemous, but it's, but I think it's true. I think, I think it's, might sound counterintuitive, but I think it's right in the sense that like kids need the space to grow and to learn and to explore and figure out who they are. And if you're up your kid's ass all the time, like you're never going to be able to really do that. Yeah, that's right. And they're not going to be able to really grow, you know, and, and at the end of the day, you might create a child or, or a person who's rather codependent. And like, I mean, there's lots of different things that can play into this, right? Like you can have where – like our society makes us work extra hard and make long hours. So we're tired and then our schools are are like factories for workers, right? So then our children are ha- have certain basic expectations that they have to meet in order to function in society. But not all kids are meant for that or can, can right. are on the same level. So then that's frustrating for teachers. That's frustrating for parents again. That's, you know, because you have to work and then come home and be a teacher. And <laughs> right, like right. And, and just families in general, the core of our, 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 the nuclear family, it's kind of like oppressive and really fucking wrong, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> well, and he, he makes the argument that, um, you know, that, you know, it takes a village. I know that's kind exactly of a cliche. Yeah. No, it's it true. really does, though. Right. <laughs> Like, you know, a lot of times we become who we are in spite of our parents and not because of them, right? Like, you know, like there are people in our lives who are much more positive influences at certain moments in our lives than our own parents were. And so what Russell's arguing for is a more sort of, you know, socialist society where, and not just socialist in the sense of like, you know, owning the means of production and, demo- and economic democracy, but he's also sort of talking about social democracy and right. the small s, small d sense, where he's talking about building institutions that provide for people to develop their to their and become their best selves in a right. way that capitalism kind of doesn't let them do. Yeah. Um, and he ends the essay with a couple of quotes which are excellent, and I think he's spot on. Where he's talking about profit, and he goes. It is a natural result of the domination of the profit-making motive that the most haphazard, unorganized, and altogether unsatisfactory departments of human activity are those from which no pecuniary profit is to be expected. And and you know, and so he's, so he's basically making the idea that like there's all these things that we should do that that are good for us that end up get, can kind of get messed up because we have to we have to organize around profit. Right. And if we didn't, then these things can end up being a lot better. The other thing he basically makes the argument for when when arguing for these kinds of reforms is that women will lead the charge on it. It's not going to be men. It's going to be women. 
And so he says, it will not be for men that a desire for the change will come. Wage earning men, even when they are socialists or communists, seldom see any need for an alteration in the status of their wives. In any, in any case, however, the construction of a cooperative of cooperative par- parallelograms, which is what he calls his sort of communal, communal, communal buildings, such as I have been advocating, could only come on a large scale as a part of a large socialistic movement, since the profit motive alone could never bring it about. And he says that will largely, some of this will be largely led by women. And I think mm. he's right. And I think if you look at the 20th century, I think that kind of panned out. Um, if you look at a lot of the the reformers within the Soviet Union, people like Alexander Kollontai, Clara Zetkin and others who argued for similar things, you know, they were, there was women who were doing that kind of work. And that, um, you know, we, we often talk about, you know, the revolution will be led by, you know, indigenous people and people of color, which I think is true. But mm-hmm. I also think it will be led by women. I, I, at this particular juncture in my life, based on my study of politics, I feel a lot more confidence in a, in a revolutionary leader who's a woman than a revolutionary leader is a man. And yeah. I, and I don't say that in the sense of like <laughs> the sort of, the, the sort of liberal bullshit about like, um, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if, um, Oh, you know, well, if Hillary was president right now, things would be better. It's like, no, <laughs> not necessarily. No, right? not necessarily. But yeah. What we're talking about is the idea that women, because they have a very specific vector of experience that we don't, as men, that um, lends itself towards, I think, a more systematic critique that might be worthwhile. Um, yeah. You know, and that's not to say men aren't important. You know, they are. <laughs> I have no context to what you are saying, but I hundred percent agree with women being leadership. LOL. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's. Um, thank you for the comment. Um, and yeah, I mean, basically the context is talking about the idea that reforms of the home and of the basic social framework of the family, those are going to be led by women. And historically they have been because men were often the wage earners who weren't a part of it. But I do think that it behooves us in the 21st century to uh, sort of support a, a sort of feministic socialism because that's right. – that's the way it works. I don't. Yeah. I don't see it happening any other way. Yeah, I think. I think it's similar in a sense to the you know, the development of like uh, a white supremacy. Like you have uh, men, white dudes, kind of benefit from the system in a certain way that makes them it blind to them. In those like those problems yeah. are blind to us. So yep. then that that's there's certain changes that have to come from women because we don't see them as problems until yes. they're pointed out to us. Exactly. No, that's right. Um, you know, my, my wife talks about all the time about how, um, you know, that she's just like, you know, she's like, Justin, you're, you're six foot three white dude. Like you can just go around and anywhere and, and you don't have to worry generally about your safety. Yeah. Um, but I do because I'm a, you know, I'm a five foot five, you know, woman. And it's like, oh yeah, that that's true. That's absolutely true. Um, and I'm also cis, right? Like, if if it was a six foot three trans person, maybe they would get some shit. You know what I mean? Like, in in the sense that like people can be truly, um, uh, you know, um, discriminatory and yeah. rude. Um, and I've seen it. You know, I've seen it in my own life where people are I'm like, we're rude, and I'm like what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you need to be nice. Like, um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think that, um, this really gets into talking about one of the lengthier essays in the book and the one that we'll probably spend the rest of the episode talking about. There's a lot of other really good essays in this book. Like there's essays where he sort of, um, he's sort of critiquing the idea of Western civilization in and of itself he talks about how like cynicism among the young is a problem. Um, yep. He talks about how uh, that if we have too much of a cookie cutter sort of homogenous culture, it can be bad for us. There's another really good book a- essay called The Ancestry of Fascism, which we can talk about for a second, where he sort of lays out in many ways a lot of the philosophical leaders who would sort of got us towards fascism. Um, and specifically, he sort of talks about some of the German thinkers, people like Fichte, 
Yeah, yeah. Fichte was one of these German idealist philosophers who came after Hegel, who sort of believed in the state as this ideal form, mm. which on some level could be worshipped, kind of like a god. And it sort of led the pathway towards fascism. Yeah, that sounds um, about right. And uh, and so, you know, he's also heavily critical, and he's one of those guys who's very similar to. Um, to Fromm in that, even though Fromm was a Marxist um, and Russell is not, Russell's one of those guys who's like very critical of capitalism, but he's also very critical of the Soviet Union. And right. There's an essay in the book where he sort of lumps communism as, as it was developed by the Soviet Union and fascism kind of in the same boat. He's like, here's, here's kind of how they're similar. Um, uh, Which, but, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, so basically he, he sort of talks about some of the main things like, so like part of the reason that he's not a Marxist is because he doesn't believe in the labor theory of value. He doesn't think that's true. Okay. Um, uh, you know, and, you know, he argues, he, he essentially believes that like communism isn't democratic. It doesn't support individual rights. Um, but, but he basically makes the argument that they're both bad, but fascism is much worse. Okay. Um, and, um, and that um, he also sort of talks about how um, the glorification of like manual laborers instead of of, of sort of mental laborers under Mar under sort of Soviet communism, which isn't necessarily true. I mean, from the beginning of the Soviet Union, you had many people devoted towards the industrial work because they were a poor peasant society who was quickly right. industrializing fast. Right? Um, you could have made the same argument about. Britain in 1830 that right. you did about the Soviet Union in 1930 that like, Oh, well they're really, really focused on that manual work, but they're not too focused on the brain work. And it's like, well, it's because they're industrializing. Yeah. So it's like, it's easy to kind of be an armchair quarterback and say that. Um, I think that he sort of came out of, he was a member of it for a while. And I don't know if he stayed a member. I think he didn't. But there is um, something called the Fabian Society. So Fabian socialism is a very specific brand of socialism that comes out of Britain. Okay. Um, it's probably most known people who were involved in it were people like Russell, the the um, the great science fiction author H.G. Wells was a part of the Fabian socialist movement. Okay. Um, it was led really by two people, a Sydney and Beatrice Webb, um, and. I think that maybe part of the reason that Russell left the Fabian Socialists was because they were a lot more bullish about the Soviet Union than he was. Mm. Um, and uh, especially Sidney and Beatrice Webb were. Um, but anyway, so Fabian Socialism is one of those that sort of develops out of, you know, you could call it, and this is going to kind of sound like an oxymoron, but but it's not when you think about the context of which Fabian Socialism developed. And also when you think about um, – the thought of like a, of an Italian socialist like Carlo Rovelli, where we're thinking about something um, like liberal socialism. Now mm. I know that sounds very like contradictory. It's like well, you, but it's not uh, in the sense that Fabian socialists really believed in developing sort of liberal democratic rights. You know, freedom right. of speech. Yeah. You know, freedom of worship. Those those kinds of bourgeois democratic rights that people really believe in. And then on top of all of that, then you develop socialism. So the Soviet Union was largely built on the idea that you would do those two things at the same time. That's where we right. get back to the idea of Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution, where we are fulfilling the bourgeois democratic parts of government that we want through developing socialism. And the Fabian socialists are more like, no, 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 no. You have to have all this other stuff first before you do socialism. It's a much more evolutionary form of socialism than a revolutionary one. Um, it's more reformist, more sort of social democratic in its form. A lot of people who were involved in the Fabian society would go on to be leaders and founders of the Labour Party um, uh -huh. in Britain. So a lot of the social democratic institutions that were sort of built out of the sort of, you know, uh, post World War II, you know, era Labor Party Britain, like the NHS and, and council housing, things like that. These were ideas that the Fabian Socialist had been proposing for a long time. Okay. Um, so Russell was in that milieu. Um, I think that I often think that 
Russell's critiques of Marxism are more caricatures of Marxism than what Marxism actually was. Right. Um, I think that if he and Eric Fromm had had a conversation, uh, <laughs> Because all the things that he says about communism and like Marxism in general are things that Fromm talked about in Marx's concept of man and said like, well, this is a bit of a straw man. This is a bit of a generalization. And this isn't really how Marx actually saw it. And here's how Marx actually saw it. And I think if you get down to it, I think that like Russell was just as critical of Leninism as he was of Marx, Marxism. Mm -hmm. So he's very much, he's very much a anti-Leninist um, as much as he is an anti-Marxist. And I think part of it is it's because he very much believed in sort of those liberal bourgeois rights and values right. that are built into the sort of Western political tradition, which are good things. You know, freedom of speech is a good thing and freedom of association and freedom of religion and due process under the law and, you know, quality yeah. before the law, all those things are good things, Right. The problem is, is that capitalism does not ensure any of them become re- in fully realized. Exactly. And that's yeah. why you need socialism. Now, on that level, Russell will agree with you. Um, and that's why we're going to then pivot into talking about probably the lengthiest essay in this book and the one that I think is kind of interesting and we'll sort of spend the rest of the episode talking about, which is his essay called The Case for Socialism. Okay. Um, and he... Um, He sort of opens it up with, I think, your typical sort of liberal socialist line, which is, uh, look, before you castigate me, I just want you to know that I think both Marxism and fascism suck. And here is why. (laughs) So he starts the essay, he starts the essay with fascism is a retort to communism and a very formidable retort. So long as socialism is preached in Marxist terms, It rouses such powerful antagonism that its success in developed Western countries becomes daily more improbable. It would, of course, have aroused opposition from the rich in any case, but the opposition would have been less fierce and less widespread. Okay. Um, You know, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think, like, I think if you look at people who've written about the sort of rise of fascism in Europe, like, uh, like Frome or Daniel Guerin or even Michael Perenni, mm. like, no, like fascism was developed in many respects, not as a retort to communism, but as a retort to liberal democracy. That it right. was it was responding to the fact that as time goes on, the sort of liberal democratic capitalist society is going to lend itself towards becoming more if <clears throat> if in its sort of perfect state, right? We're, you know, then it's ideal that it'll lend itself towards more freedom, more individual rights and so on and so forth. And fascists don't like any of that because they don't think that humans can survive well with that. Well, and yeah, because they hate anyone that isn't like a straight white cis dude. So they, <laughs> they gotta. Uh, exactly. Like, yeah. And then in the beginning of this essay, he also says something that I think explains like his particular what we would call tendency, right? Um, Which is anti-Marxist sort of Fabian socialism, where he says, for my part, while I am as convinced a socialist as the most ardent Marxian, I do not regard socialism as a gospel of proletarian revenge, nor even primarily as a means of securing economic justice. I regard it primarily as an adjustment to machine production demanded by considerations of common sense and calculated to increase the happiness not only of proletarians, but of all except a tiny minority of the human race. So again, you're getting the flavor that he's not really revolutionary. He's an evolutionary socialist. He's a reformist socialist, which obviously has its own pitfalls, but at least he's kind of putting his cards out on the table. He's kind of letting you know what he thinks. Um, I think that he... Russell was critical of all kinds of dogmas. I mean, he starts the preface to why I'm not a Christian with basically being, I'm an enemy of all dogmas, whether it be Christianity, Islam, Judaism, communism, whatever. He basically just is like, I am an enemy of dogmas. And he sees Marxism as being particularly dogmatic, which, I mean, some of that he's not wrong. That in the sense that like there were at the time when he's writing this, which is like the 1930s, there were dogmatic sort of – cult like Marxists who sort of sure. saw, you know, Stalin as nearly the second coming of Jesus Christ. And, so I it, mean, like, yeah. 
that's the 1930s. We still have yeah. some of that now, right? Like, Bingo, right? <laughs> so. We're people who sort of um, have uncritical support of places like Cuba and the DPRK. Now, mind you, I think Cuba is a lot better than the DPRK. Yes, but like, I would say uh, so. <laughs> but, um, but like Cuba has still its own not, issues. Yeah, still lots still of perfect, issues. Right? Yeah. And they sort of make excuses, right? Where it's like, well, they, it's, they're under attack by the, cap- the capitalists, so they have to be that way. The problem with that kind of logic, and I think to kind of go down a Russellian lane, is um, you could use the same argument to support capitalism. Yeah. That that you could say, well, the reason we have to have all of these austerity measures and the reason we have to put so much money into the military is to protect us from socialism, to protect right. us from the com- you know, communist Chinese and all this, right? Yeah. It's the if same you argument. have a protectionist mentality, then you can justify all kinds of nonsense. Bingo. It's the it's basically it's not a, to me that's never been a great argument for why you should like you know why we should support the Soviet Union as it became or Cuba as it became or whatever places like well they were under attack by the so, the capitalist society so they had to be this way and it's like you can make that argument and maybe historically that's probably true but that doesn't necessarily make it morally right right and exactly. you can make the same and like I said you could you could flip the argument and and use it to support capitalism. Um, Essentially, he doesn't like the idea of socialism seen as like this like religious sort of prophetic idea, which is very different than how Fromm views it. Because as we talked about in our last episode, you know, Fromm saw Marx as sort of the fulfillment of a lot of the Judeo-Christian tradition in terms of like the development of like the final solution to the problems of hum- of humanity, right? Like this, you know, not to use a phrase from the Nazis, but like the, the accumulation of like eventually we get to a, like a, a form of heaven on earth, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of what Marxism to a greater or lesser extent could be. And Russell just, it all smells too much like religion to him and he's just not interested <laughs> in it. Well, that's, that's kind of fair. Like it uh, yeah. reminds me of like Max Stirner, right? Like right. the idea that they're all like, you can't treat it as sacred because once you treat it Bingo. as sacred, then it becomes like impenetrable. You can't actually do like, it's not liberating anymore. Exactly. This is right. And you find yourself using the language of liberation to then justify oppression. Right. Yeah. Which is what I think a lot of tankies do, quite frankly. I, I agree. Um, I mean, I think it's, <laughs> they're using the sort of language of, you know, liberatory struggle as a means to sort of justify totalitarianism. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's great. And that's, um, that's, that's why you get the, the, uh, the weird ones who are defending Putin and Russia now and like oh yeah you and know that's you get so that weird odd. stuff so <laughs> well it's so odd to me because I'm like first off like Putin explicitly rejected Lenin's ideas on this yeah. national question for one two he frequently quotes fat a fascist <laughs> in his speeches <laughs> yeah and three yeah. he he basically oversaw the development of Russia as this sort of plutocratic gangster state with a lot of fucking oil and natural gas. I mean, like, like it's like <laughs> fin- it's like Finland, but with like more gangsters, right? Um, you know, it's a petrol state that is organized by the mob, and <laughs> and 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 the yeah. thing is, is that so many of those people who are part of that plutocratic gangster capitalism of Russia were people who were former Communist Party members. You know, they were people who came, you know, came out of the Kremlin. They went from being, you know, diehard stalwarts of the revolution to being, you know selling off their country to the highest bidder for, right. for the highest amount of dollars they could get, right? Um, and so I think it's very instructive that dogmatism, I think, is very dangerous to any kind of political project. I think that yeah. – um, I think it's harmful. And I think that's the, the – you know, that's why my form of socialism is a sort of ecumenical one where I'm not – you know, I, I'm not – I'm not these days I'm less and less comfortable sort of having a particular like tendency or saying here's my particular view right. other than broadly describing myself as a marxist which is true but like but I follow a very different tradition um and so Russell is <laughs> sort of making the argument he's like we can get to socialism without any of this like revolution bullshit and here's how we do it and, okay. and I'm like I'm like okay well so let's see how you want to do it <laughs> let's see what we, and he see makes this case for socialism and when you and about halfway through the essay, I realized, oh, he's not going to tell you how to get there. Right. He's going to tell you what you should do and why you should do it. He's making this. He's essentially making a moral claim 
for why we should be, you know, it really should be called. Which the is moral fine basis. if that's what he's doing. Right? If you and know that is what, what he's, he's doing. doing. But so. part of that is because he genuinely believed that, like, if you built democracy, that democracy would expand more and more over time to the point where eventually you would just have socialism. And right. So he talks about very specific things where he talks about, um, uh, you know, what does what is socialism to Bertrand Russell? What is it? He nicely lays it out in a definition. He says, let us begin by a definition of socialism. The definition must consist of two parts, economic and political. The economic part consists in state ownership of ultimate economic power, which involves as a minimum land and minerals, capital, banking, credit, and foreign trade. The political part requires that the ultimate political power should be democratic. Um, and he says Marx himself, and practically all socialists before 1918, would have agreed to this part of the definition without question. But since the Bolsheviks dissolved the Russian Constituent Assembly, a different doctrine has grown up according to which when a socialist government has achieved success by revolution, only its most ardent supporters are to have political power. So he's very critical of, in some respects, what did happen with the Soviet Union, where it went from being, you yeah. know, a a feudal imperial monarchy where you had the royal family, the, 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 the Romanovs at the very top, kind of making all of the decisions to being the, the Politburo and the sort of the non-elected bureaucrats who ended up yeah. running the Soviet Union. Right. Um, and you can make an argument, well, it was wartime they had to fight a civil war and some and of that's lots true. Of, yeah. There's lots of reasons why these things happen, but does yeah. that make them the right, the thing we want? Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and can you morally justify it? And Russell yeah. essentially says no. So his, so his view of socialism is economic and political democracy. And we can quibble about like the state part of it. So he believes very much in state ownership of stuff, right. which, um, which essentially I agree with too. Um, <laughs> and um, he also talks about how, um, so he, he sort of gives the how do we get there a little bit where he says a socialist government, which has carried out the economic part of socialism, will not have completed its task until it has secured enough popular support to make democratic government possible. Mm. So he, he sort of talks about how if you don't build institutions of democratic governments and accountability, these systems will sort of devolve into um, uh, totalitarian states, which on that level, he's right. Um, right. I think that. Um, you know, and the moment that the Soviet Union started to institute more democratic forms in the 1980s, in the form of Glasnost and Perestroika under the Gorbachev era, um, the Soviet Union collapsed in yeah. basically five or six years. Um, and so those two things didn't work well when you had such a top down command economy that was largely controlled by unelected bureaucrats. It's very hard to like. Put a little, you can I has a little democracy as a treat. Like, yeah, the moment right. you offer that to people, the whole system kind of collapses because of its internal contradictions. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's what he's arguing for is, is very much what democratic socialists would today. You know, his argument is not very different from people like Michael Harrington, one of the founders of the Democratic Socialists of America, okay. um, Bashkar Sankara, the founder and editor of Jacobin, um, and other sort of democratic socialists. Uh, you know, elected officials, people like Bernie Sanders, um, right. a great, greater or lesser extent AOC, that like the way you get to socialism is by expanding economic democracy while simultaneously expanding political democracy. That those two things go hand in hand, which I okay. agree with. I think that's sure. fair. And I think it's a lot easier said than done. And the question is whether or not you get to a, you, you get there through reformist means or revolutionary means, um, which is something we'll talk about later in the year when we do Rosa Luxemburg. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. But I think, uh, like, uh, you're kind of seeing like, uh, what, like the U S right now, you have such a, a backlash of reactionary forces just in the very idea of, uh, expanding economic, uh, democracy, like, or even political democracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it, it may, it makes it hard to know if that's like actually a feasible strategy. When it seems so like you're pushing a boulder up a hill, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it feels very like a like a Sisyphean struggle. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so, okay, so what, so what is he sort of arguing for? Like, what are sort of the very specific policy things he's arguing for? So he's definitely arguing for uh, a, a four-hour workday. 
He's arguing for public control of most of the economy. Um, so when he says the state, he essentially means democratic control. Right. Um, and so he believes in public banking. He believes in public utilities. Um, so like today, like Bertrand Russell would support the, um, the democratization of the internet. We're kind oh, yeah. of going back yeah. to our conversation. We talked about Ben Turnoff's book about the internet. Internet for the people. Internet for the people, where we talk about moving it away, decommodification. Um, I think, you, you know, um, the control of the energy industry should be in public hands. So yeah. like ExxonMobil should not be a private corporation. It should be controlled by the state or by the public generally. And whatever profits or proceeds it gets, it puts in, either into the hands of the people, which is what they did in, to a greater or lesser extent in Venezuela and in Brazil, um, or you use that to then invest in alternative energies, um, you know, wind, solar, yeah. uh, hydroelectric power, nuclear power, whatever. And, um, and so he also argued, he also makes a really good point about how socialists aren't going to take your fucking toothbrush. Right. Um, so <laughs> he, he makes the clear distinction between personal property and private property, private property being the means of production capital owned in private hands versus <laughs> personal property, which is your toothbrush and your TV and the shit. It's so depressing that we always have to say this over and over and over. Yeah. Again. And he makes that point very clear in his book too. He has to make that point too. Yeah. Um, he basically, he also argues for a public healthcare system, public housing, nice. a universal basic income. Um, and he's, he's, he's saying that the way that we get there is through democratic participation and persuasion that if we go out and we make our argument, this is where like the sort of analytical part of Russell comes in. Like right. if we're just logical, we just go out to people and we explain how logical it is. Yeah. He believes that argument can win the day. Any <laughs> argument can win. And this is where I kind of don't always agree. In sense, yeah. Like how do we, I mean, I think part of it is it's a, it's a mixture for me at least Socialism should be a mixture of both reason and passion. Right. Reason in the sense that you are you're making the logical argument, you're explaining to people why the profit motive is a problem, you're explaining to them that having an economic system based on the profit motive leads to waste, it leads to inefficiency, it leads to um, monopolization, it leads to a lack of creativity, a lack of innovation, lack of entrepreneurship, it yeah. actually destroys all the things that it says it is purportedly doing. And you can make that very logical argument to people. But you also have to be passionate about it, that you have to make the moral case for it, too. It's not enough to just explain to people that, um, that like, yeah, social, that capitalism sucks. You have to make the argument that, like, because they know that. Like, most people yeah. know that capitalism sucks. They may not say it in the exact words that we would, um, you know, us highfalutin people who, you know, have our $10 SAT words. Like, they may not necessarily say it the way we do, but they know that it sucks, right? Yeah. And he talks about how one of the things that we'll have to combat is, it, and he's actually, this is where he's quite prescient. And I think it's, it's really smart. Where he talks about the idea of snobbery and about how like we have to not be snobs yep. and how we have to make an argument against being a snob. So he says, um, he sort of says like, the result of our system is that there is a great waste of ability. A boy or girl born of wage earning parents may be of the first rate capacity in mathematics or music or science, but it's very unlikely that he or she will have a chance to exercise this talent. Moreover, education, at least in England, is still infected, is still infected through and through with snobbery. And, um, you know, and he says, it is not to be expected, therefore, that the present defects of, in the educational system can be remedied until the economic system has been transformed. So he's, so again, he's sort of fighting against this idea. And again, this is a guy who could have been a snob, like right. in some respects was a product of snobbery, right? Like his, his grandfather who raised him was fucking prime minister. Like, right. you know, this was a guy who, you know, grew up with an immense amount of privilege. He didn't really have to have a real job most of his life. Right. And, or at all. Yeah. And he's very much making the argument that like, I know based on my learning that this sucks and you know it from your experience that this sucks. Yeah. So let's team up on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that he's making not just like a practical, logical argument, but in a lot of respects, he's also making a logical one. Uh, not a logical one. He's making a logical one, but he's also making a moral one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he's also talking about the idea of um, the big thing about him, and he spends a huge chunk of this essay on is about war. And I think it's important to talk about this because of, of – um, but he talks about how – 
Um, only international socialism, I'm quoting him here, will afford a complete safeguard against war, but national socialism and all the principal civilized countries would, as I shall try to show, enormously diminish its likelihood. So again, he's not saying like Nazis, national socialism. He's right. describing that if a country is socialist, like if more countries were socialist, then the chances of, of war would, would decrease. Right. Um, and yeah. then if a truly international system developed, war would also start to decrease. Yeah. Um, and that only through international cooperation can socialism really thrive, which in this level, he actually kind of agrees with Trotsky. Right. Um, and so he, he talks about how, um, oh, he makes a really interesting point that he talks about how like so socialism is not anti-religion. So interestingly enough, the guy who wrote why I'm not a Christian actually goes out of his way to say like, Hey, socialists aren't out to take your religion because right. again, he's reacting to the Soviet union where they were very actively anti-religion in yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah. That's his, um, uh, like, that's his liberal values coming out, right? Like, yeah. So he says, like, um, while religion – with religion, socialism has nothing to do. It is an economic doctrine, and a socialist might be a Christian or a Mohammedan, a Buddhist, or a worshiper of Brahma without any logical inconsistency, mm -hmm. um, which I think is great. Um, and he sort of talks about how if you build a world where people's needs are met, then – and you destroy the profit motive, then in a lot of ways, the need to, to create stuff to blow people up and to destroy their shit won't really be there. The incentives won't be there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's very logical. Um, he does actually mention in towards the end of the essay um, about the sort of reform versus revolution question. So he does okay. mention something about it. He says, is it really the case as communists maintain that socialism, a system so universally beneficent and so easy to understand, a system moreover recommended by the obvious breakdown of the present economic regime and by the pressing danger of universal disaster through war, is it really the case that the system cannot be presented persuasively except to proletarians and a handful of intellectuals and can only be introduced by a means of a bloody, doubtful, and destructive civil war? I, for my part, find this impossible to believe. Socialism, in some respects, runs counter to ancient habits and therefore arouses an impulsive opposition, which can only be overcome gradually. And in the minds of its opponents, it has become associated with atheism and a reign of terror. Um, so again, he's making the argument right there. He's like saying, you don't get there through revolution. Yeah. I, don't, I think that the moral case for that is bad. And I also think the practical case for it is bad. Um, and so he's saying right out, this is a gradual thing. You build upon previous successes. Right. And the real challenge to that, I think, is the last 40 years um, in the sense that the social democratic system that was developed after World War II, the great convergence of the 1940s through the 1970s, um, broke down. And a lot of the social democratic gains that people thought would be permanent started to get rolled back and rolled back pretty quickly. Um, you cannot leave it to the system itself to maintain its social democratic institutions. Mm -hmm. You have to actively fight for them. Um, and so that's, I think that's one of the bigger problems with the idea of reformism is that reformism can go away just as quickly, if not more quickly, as the reforms came about in the first yeah. place. Yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know if he's convinced me on that. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think that, um, I do, I, I do tend to lean towards like, uh, like a social revolution rather than a physical yes. violent revolution. I do too. But, but also I don't know if that's going to work either. So. Right. Because at the end of the day, no amount of social persuasion counteracts guns. Yeah. That's, uh, right. that's, that's really the tricky part. Um, and I think that um, I, I'm of kind of two minds of this. I kind of have a synthesis on it where, and I've talked about this before, but like, I think that reforms get you to that revolution in the sense that like you build upon previous successes, you fight for them, right? Like, right. I think that people need to fight for, you know, public education. They need to fight for the eight hour workday. They need to fight for 
the you know increasing the minimum wage and 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 bolstering social security and all of those things that are good social democratic institutions that have m- helped millions of people yeah and they've lifted millions of people out of poverty and human misery right and the proof is in the pudding they work right like if it was just if we lived in a logical world we would live in a socialist one by yeah now. that's right and and so i think it's like i think it's um i just think it's unreasonable to accept it right away and i think you have to build social movements to get there. This is where I'm, I'm, I think Russell may not have, dis, wouldn't have disagreed because he was a part of social movements, whether it right. was the anti-nuclear, mo- the anti-nuclear bombs movements or the anti-war movements. Like he was involved in many different social movements and political parties. So he saw them as being important. And I do too. I mean, mm-hmm. to me, I see the future of socialism success predicated on really two things, the union and the party. You need a, a political, you need unions to become stronger, more powerful, to get more demands. And you need political parties that bolster the unions and unions that bolster a political party. That's the way to do it, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and so if you look at the history of the world and you look at the history of the development of socialism and many of its different flavors, yeah. you know, it's always been some combination of yeah. the party and or unions. Yeah. It's always been that. So I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, like the unions put the power into the hands of the workers. Right. And parties is, it's kind of how you have to deal with the current status quo, right? So exactly. There, you got to use the tools at hand, essentially. Exactly. And ultimately, it should be predicated on a commitment to democracy. Yeah. So I'm going to leave you with the final few sentences of this essay where he says, on the contrary, every appeal to unconstitutional violence helps on the growth of fascism. Whatever may be the weaknesses of democracy, it is only by means of it and by the help of the popular belief in it that socialism can hope to succeed in Great Britain or America. Whoever weakens the respect for democratic government is intentionally or unintentionally increasing the likelihood, not of socialism or communism, but of fascism. Mm. That is, I think, absolutely right. Um, I think that's why, you know, when people say, oh, well, you know, American democracy is a sham and whatever. I'm like, to a, I agree with you to a point. Right, okay? right. But like democratic institutions matter and you're going to really miss them when they're gone. <laughs> like when yeah. you finally completely go kaput, you're going to, you're going to yeah. notice it. That's right. And I think it's no surprise that as democracies have started to decline, that the rise of nationalism or fascism goes along with it. Yeah. Um, I, I, like I said earlier, I really feel like um, fascism is a response to the failures of liberal democracy and not, and not socialism. Um, socialism is, you know, like, you know, Socialism is the solution to the problem. So instead of vacillating between sort of liberalism and fascism, which is what most of the world history has done, you break that binary. Mm. You recognize it for the false dichotomy that it is and say, you know what? The solution to all this shit is socialism. It, you know, it solves the democratic problem and it, it, cause it's an, it's an, it's a growth and, and broadening of democracy and it takes care of the fascism element and that we get rid of, we get rid of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the problem is, is that like, uh, this is where it's like history's a bitch <laughs> because like fascists never really ever got defeated by simply advocating for democracy. Nope. That's true. You know, <laughs> they won't, they, they won't just go away. <laughs> these people can't be reasoned with. Yeah. You know, it's that, you know, I always go back to it, you know, that classic, you know, um, you know, that classic little bit in the dark night where we're, Michael Caine is Alfred, you know, he's talking about these, these people, they're like, you know, they don't, you can't reason with them. You can't, you can't convince yeah. them. You can't persuade them. Some people just want to watch the world burn. And that's right. Like there's fascism is predicated upon nihilism at, at the end of the day. If you really get it down to its core element, it really genuinely believes that human beings are absolute rubbish yeah, and that nothing will ever be good. So we just have to give ourselves up to the party or the leader to fulfill any sense of meaning because we can't make it for ourselves because we don't believe in humanity and we don't believe in democracy. So it ultimately is predicated on this sort of nihilism at its core. Mm 
And socialism is the complete opposite of that. <laughs> right. Socialism is a philosophy that's predicated on hope. It's predicated on human flourishing. Yep. And it's also predicated on like, like the belief in the human spirit for lack of like a better way of saying it. Like we as socialists, we believe that the world can be better and that history has shown us that it can be better. Yeah. And that, um, you know, we can by hook or by crook, we are going to make it better because we believe in that yeah. or we will, or we'll die trying to do it. And that that will be a noble death. And, and so it's very much the opposite of nihilism. I feel like I have so much that I believe in. Yeah, for sure. Um, and rather than um, than what the fascists are. So, um, and I think Russell did too. So I think that's, you know, I think that, I think everybody, if you don't read this whole book, I highly recommend people read the title essay in Praise of Idleness and read the, the Case for Socialism. I think it's a good essay. I think he's, he's, inadvertently hitting upon all of like the central questions of socialism right. that people have and really giving a good answer to them. Um, um, despite his sort of anti-Marxist tendency. Right. So, um, but regardless of that, I mean, Bertrand Russell is somebody I really like as a thinker. He's somebody I've learned a lot from, sure. and he's definitely a humanist in the broadest sense of the term, yeah. whether he's a Marxist or not. So, um, so yeah, so that's in praise of idleness. Um, I recommend people check it out or at very least the two essays that I, that we mostly discussed tonight. Very cool. I guess what are we covering next time? I guess so next. Yeah. Before we go to there, yes. uh, reminder that Thursday we're doing our Thursday, live stream. Folks. All right. Thursday, 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 Thursday. What is that? June. Is it today's 20th? June 22nd, yeah. 7 PM. We will be doing our second red reviews live stream. We're going to be talking about uh, the book Rich People Things by Chris Lehman, which is a really fun book of like social criticism. Um, Lehman is a writer for The Baffler and The Nation and, and really cool. And his list of what he thinks rich people things are. So we're going to kind of go through his list. And then we're also going to like talk about, well, if you were going to make because his book came out like 10 years ago. Right. So if you could update the list, what would you put on the list now um, and why? And so we'll probably spend some time doing that. And then we'll also be doing a Q and a, of course, where anybody can answer, ask their questions and we can try to give answers as best we can. Sounds great. Okay. So now what are we covering next time? <laughs> so next time in two weeks, uh, for our regular episodes, we're going to, we're going to be covering the S word by John Nichols, um, yeah. history of an American tradition, socialism. We're going to be talking about the history of American socialism. Um, we're going to do a couple books this year about that. We're going to do, um, Paul Bull's book on American Marxism later on in the year. Um, yeah. but this, uh, but we're going to be talking about the S, S words. So we're going to be talking all about Thomas Paine and how Marxists worked for Abraham Lincoln. And we're going to talk right. about Eugene V. Debs and, and, um, and cool. A. Philip Randolph and all the, all the, that, you know, Amer socialism is as American as apple pie. Anybody who tells you different doesn't know their history. So, yeah, no kidding. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that's what we'll be covering next time. Right on. And I guess all that's left is where can people find you? So you guys can find me, where is it at? Right down there. You can find me at <laughs> justinclark.org. That's my website. You can find all my writing. You can find all of our podcast episodes there. Um, I just put up the episode we did on Towards a Marxist Humanism by Lizette Kolakowski. That episode is now up on the website. Um, and then uh, my newest essays are up on the website as well. Um, my cool. retrospective on Christopher Hitchens' God is Not Great is on the website. That was published also in the Truth Seeker magazine, where I'm a regular contributor. And um, my essay in Praise of Idleness for the 21st Century, where I talk about what we've discussed this evening with a couple other things in it as well. So that's where you guys can find me. Um, you can also find me on social media at Justin Clark PH, PH is for public history um, on Instagram. Um, that's really the only social media site I use um, and where I regularly post my my blog posts and my essays for the truth seeker and our podcasts and book reviews and all kinds of other stuff there as well. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Thanks, Corey. It's been fun. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. A big thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie Athope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. 
If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like or you on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for watching or listening. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.